I'm a general internist uh, who uh, trained, uh, you know, back in the 80s, uh, and then got very interested in the uh, problem of uh, early diagnosis and sort of the two sides uh, of the story. Um, and I, uh, early on at Dartmouth, I started at Dartmouth in 1990, I uh, met a young uh, radiologist who was also interested in this uh, general problem. And I, I think what caught me sort of by surprise was how sort of broad spread the, the issue was that whenever we tried to diagnose patients early, we found a whole lot more people had the disease or condition that uh, we were interested in. And so that meant all of a sudden we were treating a whole lot more people and I began to wonder whether that was really a good thing. Most people come uh, to the question of screening with the preconception that early diagnosis can only have one effect on them, benefit. And so most of my efforts has been to try to balance that equation so they understand there's two effects of, of early detection. Yes, there's a potential to help people, but there's also this known uh, downside of the process, which is involving too many people in the system, operating on too many people, giving too many people chemotherapy and radiation. Of course, the poster child for that problem has been the prostate cancer uh, screening uh, uh, our experience. And um, in many ways, because the problems were so egregious there, it, it actually helped the medical profession begin to realize, oh my gosh, there really is a balance here, and we need to think about it more carefully. The approach to uh, prostate cancer screening, uh, starting in the late 1980s, has been a, quote, simple blood test, and the simple blood test is the prostate-specific uh, antigen. And I always uh, am amused by its uh, description as a simple blood test because, of course, it is simple to obtain, but it raises some of the most complex issues uh, in medicine. And uh, quite frankly, we launched this on the population without really understanding what those issues were. We sort of assumed, of course, it's good to be looking for early prostate cancer. Well, the minute we started uh, doing this, um, all of a sudden the incidence rates, the n rate of new cases of prostate cancer just skyrocketed, like nothing we'd ever seen before in uh, the cancer data. Literally doubled in the period of uh, two or three years. And that had a very powerful effect on doctors. They couldn't believe how many men had prostate cancer. And that actually was a little bit of a wake-up call, like, well, what does this mean? You know, we know about 3% of men are destined to die of prostate cancer, but all of a sudden we're diagnosing it in upwards of 20% of men. And then people started looking at autopsy studies and they realized, you know, men who had died of other causes, if you look at their prostate carefully, men over 50 and 60, over half have pathologic evidence of prostate cancer. So now we have this complex kind of issue. There is the prostate cancer that kills people, but then we have all this reservoir of other prostate cancers that don't kill people. Well, that's a problem because once we make the diagnosis of prostate cancer, we act. And in the case of prostate cancer, the treatment is really hard. The first and mainstay treatment is radical prostatectomy, and radical prostatectomy leads somewhere to around half of men to be impotent, and somewhere between a third, uh, uh, around a third are, are made to have difficulty going to the bathroom. Either they have trouble starting their stream or they can't control their stream, they're, they're incontinent. And the other major treatment is radiation, and, and radiation to the pelvis causes all sorts of problems. It can cause radiation uh, proctitis uh, in the rectum, which is quite painful, and can lead to the development of fistulas, and it, it's a hard therapy. And if we knew that was helping people, maybe that's one thing, but all of a sudden it became clear that we were doing this therapy so much more often on men who couldn't benefit from it. And that's why there's now, <clears throat> really a coming together that recognizes that prostate cancer screening is actually a pretty awful deal. Um, and that's why the U.S. Preventative Health Services Task Force has now recommended against it. It's very hard for doctors to describe this balance in a clinic visit. There's so many things that need to go on in a clinic visit and everyone knows that time with the doctor is a very short, it's probably too short. 
uh, the amount of time patients have with doctors. So I think it's very important to do uh, an education effort at a more uh, global level. And some of that's being done through shared decision-making videos and so forth. Um, and that's part of what I'm trying to do in writing a book and writing articles for the public, is to help them understand some of these issues before uh, they see the doctor. Uh, because quite frankly, the doctor may not understand all the issues because he or she has covering so many different bases. Uh, screening is a complex issue and they, they may not understand it. Um, so I, I think we need to work on sort of more public and, uh, uh, education efforts just so they understand the, the balance going on. And I think to some extent that's happening. Um, my read of the general public uh, now is much different than it would have been uh, 10 or 15 years ago. I think there's a general growing recognition that, that while medical care can do some very good things for people, there are also places where we've gone overboard. And one place we've probably gone overboard is in general with early detection. My standard approach as a doctor for prostate cancer screening has been to sort of see where the patient uh, is at. And some men come in and they really want to be screened, they've had a friend, and, so, and, they, and their preferences are very strong towards screening, and I, I've been honest about that, I'll screen them. Um, I have some men that don't even want to raise the issue, they say, Doc, if it's not broke, don't fix it, and I don't talk to them a lot about it, I, I say, that's fine. The people who get talked to a lot are saying, Doc, what's the, what's the debate about? and they get more information than they possibly want. I mean, we, we, we spend a lot, of, a lot of time on it. But if patients ask me directly, what do I recommend? I, I say I recommend not to be screened. I, I think the future of screening is we're gonna be more careful about it, and I think that's a good thing. I think there's now a more a general understanding of a certain level of skepticism about the value of finding things before patients experience uh, any symptoms or problems from them. But there are, so I, I think in the academic community of medicine, there's now much more healthy skepticism about the general problem. That's my feeling. Um, but I, I, I got to be clear, there are strong commercial forces always out there looking for new ways to label people as disease because that starts a, a treatment cascade and, and, and it's a great way to make a lot of money. The reality is it, it, it's much easier to find a new patient to use your therapy on than it is to develop a better therapy.